there was a time when we knew nothing and we feared everything. A modern mind finds it impossible to imagine the world through the eyes of a prehistoric human. But there's no such thing as a modern mind. We are only modern in as much as we were born recently. When an anthropologist talks about the first modern humans, they mean those that appeared 100,000 to 200,000 years ago, ancient and prehistoric by any other definition. Those humans, the first, were identical to us. They were us. Your brain is the brain of a prehistoric human. You're the same animal with the same instincts. You just know more. Who didn't have a monster under their bed when they were a kid? Who hasn't had the hairs on their neck stand up because of a spooky shadow? Where does that spooky feeling come from? When my hairs stand on end, and when a cat's hairs stand on end, are we both feeling the same thing? 100,000 years ago, without the benefit of a modern education, you and I would be scratching the dirt, very mindful of the hours of daylight left. Because the night was even more dangerous, by far, than the day. That was when the beasts came, silent, like ghosts. You never knew they were there. Every now and then someone, usually a child, would sleep too far from the campfire and disappear, screaming into the long grass, their agony and despair fading into the night. Every now and then someone died from a fever, again, screaming. You think you wouldn't have been afraid. You think that they were the dumb humans and you are the new, improved version. Mm, no. Same model, same flaws. Fear isn't always a bad thing. Fear has probably saved your life several times already. An instinctive fear of the dark is probably essential to our ancestors' survival. When they were forced down from the safety of the trees in Africa, it happened too fast for them to adapt. Our tree-dwelling pre-Australopithecine ancestors were effectively dumped on the ground at a severe physical disadvantage. What animal can't outrun us? What use is a hand against a claw? Our ancestors were, in evolutionary terms, like fish out of water with nothing but a larger than average brain, some social skills, and two heavily adapted forelegs. But when a small population finds itself in a new and different environment, certain pre-existing advantageous traits can become accentuated over as few as ten generations. The Australopithecines had no time to evolve the speed, nocturnal vision or physical defences required to match the fully ground adapted predators. What saved our genetic line was not just intelligence. Those early hominids weren't that smart. An intelligence won't stop you dropping your guard anyway. Our pre-human ancestors had the natural caution of all the other animals, but those animals were all so much faster. The feeble pre-humans had to be more cautious still, more cautious than all the other prey, especially at night. Question is, who drops their guard the least? Is it the confident, the nervous, or the paranoid? When it was every ape man or ape woman for him or herself, when we needed to see the predators in the shadows but could not, the only ones likely to survive long enough to pass on their genes were the very nervous, the ones that saw danger in every shadow, even those shadows that they knew were empty. That is the level of caution a slow, unarmed, feeble little ape needs when the trees are gone. And this, I believe, was the seed of that spooky feeling we all know so well. When you never know that the beast is there, you have to feel that it always is. In a population of the slow and feeble, only the paranoid survive to breed. And then the paranoid children of the paranoid parents breed. And in ten generations we're all checking shadows obsessively, carrying lucky charms and staring nervously at the shadow that we can't quite reach same as we do every night. We've evolved paranoid. We humans must be the most frightened animal on the planet 
It's no surprise that less imaginative animals look around with better eyes and see what danger there really is. While, by the time we humans came along, we'd evolved to see as many dangers as we could imagine with our inferior eyes shut. It's one thing to have a monster under your bed. It's another to have parents that think that they can see it too. Everybody was afraid. And the sky was full of gods. But which of the gods needed to be appeased? How could people escape this suffocating fear? Which god would offer the best protection? Is there something after death? Which god is in charge of that? Which is the most powerful god? What do the gods want? Why are they so cruel? What did we do to deserve to be eaten alive, poisoned, starved, crushed, broken, burned, frozen, infected, suffocated, drowned, choked, impaled? Humans have always looked to the sky for the answers. Perhaps that's down to our intelligence. There must have been a sense that the motions and slowly shifting patterns in the sky all meant something. They had to mean something. But no matter what god the people prayed to, whatever rituals they observed, no matter how diligently, adults and children just kept dying like before. There was no reason to it, no end to it, no logic or pattern that we could see. The cruelty of the gods was so obviously beyond human understanding. And that's how things stayed, pretty much. For 100 to 200,000 years, Then, a man who many would one day call the first philosopher, Thales, became the first person to ever successfully predict a solar eclipse. That eclipse happened, we think, on May the 28th, 585 BCE. We don't know if Thales got the time or the date or even the month right. We don't know how he did it. But there isn't much argument that he did do it. It was quite a moment that day when the sky turned black. An ordinary man had predicted what no priest, oracle, prophet or mystic, or God, had ever foretold. Something changed in that moment. We didn't have to be afraid anymore. Thales showed us how. It's sadly ironic that those early humans were right. Those changing patterns in the sky did mean something. And the answer to so many fears was in the sky, though in the form of a window on understanding the universe, rather than the blessing of a god. Learning about the world, understanding it, can free us from our deepest instinctive fears. This is a miracle you can believe in. Knowledge can transform us. That which once terrified us can become a thing of the greatest beauty, simply by understanding it how it came to be, what it is, what it is not, and why it cannot harm you. Thales may only have given us an approximate date for his eclipse, but two and a half thousand years later we've learned to predict them down to the second, and in the process we've learned about the galaxies and the quarks and everything in between. And on all scales, at all times and places, we see the same rules in operation, nothing more, nothing less, if we can reproduce the conditions, we can reproduce any phenomenon. And each time we learn something new, life becomes ever more naturally explicable without the need of a supernatural agent at any point. Without an all-powerful God in the way, the ugliness and the cruelty of life become, if not more forgivable, then at least understandable. This is as fair as the universe could be. Tragedies are the infinitely regrettable but inevitable byproducts of life simply being possible in the first place. The causes of all tragedies are the causes of life itself. The gravity that kills is the same gravity that makes stars shine, planets form and keeps all the other kids safely on the ground. The universe doesn't hate us, it doesn't toy with us or mock us, torture us or punish us. We are not born into any shame. To say we are is a crime against humanity. We inflict shame on ourselves to atone for our imperfections while trying to be more perfect than we can be. 
that's almost noble and dumb at the same time. Earth made us like this. From a natural fear of the dark, our ancestors developed, via survival necessity, an instinctive fear of the unseen and the invisible, which our higher minds confuse as the fear of the unknown and the unknowable. But it doesn't have to be like that. That's what Thales taught me anyway.